the forensics of this case don't make sense. They don't make sense with an intruder theory anyway. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name is Kay Philpott and I cover true crime and missing person cases on my channel. Today, I'm bringing a case to you that is unsolved and has so many unanswered questions because not a lot of what was told to authorities actually made much sense, but I'll let you be the judge of that. I will also say we're getting some work done on the house today, so there might be some random banging in the background. There's nothing I can really do about it. So this is the case of Robert Wan. Robert Wan was a fourth generation Chinese American who was born in Manhattan and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. His parents were doing pretty well for themselves and they had pretty normal jobs. His father worked in a bank and his mother was a librarian. And when I tell you about Robert's background, you could very well feel like a total piece of shit because he was such an amazing person and he had such a big heart. So Robert was very hard working and that applied to literally everything he did academically as well as athletically and he was always a hugely active member of his local community and later on when he was studying as part of a scholar program at the college of william and mary he even volunteered himself and some friends to help with the school renovations because the renovation fund had run out and he just loved the school so much he wanted to provide and when he found out that the former president of the school lived alone and struggled significantly with spinal arthritis he started bringing some friends over each week to help out in any way that they could that's just how robert saw the world he really wanted to help whoever he could he also put together a society on campus called the 13 club where he and the other club members would just do random acts of kindness and he was clearly very ambitious as well and wanted more than anything to become a successful lawyer. And he went to the University of Pennsylvania to study law. Now, in January of 2002, Robert met a woman called Catherine Ellen Yu. And this was at a conference in Philadelphia. And the two of them hit it off straight away. They had dinner that night, they talked for hours, and then they met up again on Valentine's Day in 2002, which would have been like, what, a few weeks later. And it was actually really cute because both of them brought the other a cute little gift. Robert's gift, for example, was a box of chocolates with a note that said, where to from here? I'm not certain, but I'm excited to find out if you are. But the thing was, Kathy lived in Chicago and Robert lived in Washington DC at this point. So it wasn't easy to keep things going, but they were both so invested in this budding relationship so early on that they made it work long distance. They spoke on the phone every night and they met up in person three times a month, which is pretty good cool going. Three times a month is like almost every week. Something to know about Kathy is that she had been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called lupus and she was really worried about telling Robert because she thought he would probably run a mile. Seeing as, you know, she might need to lean on him in more ways than someone without lupus would. But of course, our Robert was not like that at all. He, he had a heart of gold and that heart was set on Kathy and it didn't matter what she told him. In fact, it was around this time where he invited her to go with him and his parents to China for a month long trip. And it wasn't even that long after that until Robert and Kathy were engaged and then married. They got married on the 7th of June, 2003. They moved in together in a residential area in DC. Robert had a job that allowed him to really give back to the community a lot and he did a lot of pro bono work and stuff like that. But in summer of 2006, he got a new job at Radio Free Asia, which similarly enough, like it was all based around giving back because this was a nonprofit that broadcasted news and stuff to Asian countries that wouldn't otherwise have access. And he was loving this new job. He got such incredible fulfillment from being able to help people in this way. So this all leads up to a day that changed absolutely everything. And that was the 2nd of August, 2006. That evening, Robert attended a dinner and a legal seminar with a lawyer from Radio Free Europe. And Robert was a very organized person. He had known for weeks that on this particular night, if he went home after the seminar, he would have had to commute the whatever, 20 miles home at like 9 p.m. at the earliest and then commute all the way back in for 9 a.m. the next morning. So it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to go home. So he had planned this night out weeks in advance. 
He asked an old friend of his, Joe Price, if he could stay over at his because Joe's townhouse was quite central near the DuPont Circle in Washington DC. So it was not far from Robert's office. So on this night, before he went to Joe's house, he actually went back to the office to catch up with some of the night shift workers before making his way over to Joe's house on Swan Street. I think it's interesting to dive into what kind of relationship Robert and Joe had. They both had gone to law school together and they stayed relatively close over the years after that. And Joe was a few years older, so he acted as somewhat of a mentor for Robert for quite a while, to be honest. Joe was a fairly out there member of the LGBTQ plus community and he lived with his partner, Victor Zaborski and their friend, Dylan Ward. So Joe and Victor had been committed for, I believe it was around 10 years at this point, but Joe and Dylan also had some, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> that was for four years and it was all out in the open. So there was nothing sketchy about it. There was no cheating as such. It was more like the three of them were in like a polyamorous kind of relationship, but I don't know if there was any involvement between Victor and Dylan specifically. Although, maybe there was, I don't know. <laughs> no judgment here, but that's just to set the scene for you. They also had another tenant in the basement apartment underneath the house, but this had its own separate entrance. And that was a girl whose name was Sarah. Side note, Joe, Dylan and Victor were also said to have thrown Robert's 30th birthday party a few years prior. So they had definitely been pretty close. Joe was a very successful lawyer and he did a lot of work for the LGBTQ plus community. And he also loved entertaining. He loved having people over to the house. So of course he'd have no problem whatsoever with Robert staying the night, you know? Now Victor was the director of marketing for some big corporation and Dylan wrote, edited and published children's books. So all three of them were pretty successful. They were doing really well for themselves. They are pretty legitimate, as legitimate as you can get really. Dylan and Joe both did some side work for an LGBT nonprofit as well. Anyway. At about 10.30 p.m. this night on August the 2nd, 2006, Robert arrives to the residence on Swan Street. But by 12.25 a.m., not even two hours later, Robert Wan was pronounced dead. What the hell happened here? Let's talk about it. So here's a general timeline of the night and what happened inside the house. What we know to have happened anyway. Sarah, who lived in the basement apartment, was staying at a friend's house that night, so she wasn't there. But at 10.30 p.m., Robert arrives and he's greeted by Joe and Dylan who were already in the house. They had a drink of water in the kitchen and made some small talk. They were talking about the hot weather recently, family, house repairs, just, you know, random small talk, nothing crazy. And Victor just wasn't really part of this because he had just returned from a business trip and he was pretty tired. He just wanted to go to bed for the night. So he said he'd catch up with Robert over breakfast. So Victor was in his bedroom on the third floor, the one that he shared with Joe. And after a few short chats, Robert let the guys know that he was actually pretty tired as well after his long day. So they led him into the office on the second floor, which was made up as a guest room with a little sofa bed and stuff. Then Dylan took a sleeping pill. This was around 11 p.m. And while it was still taking effect, he was reading a magazine before drifting off to sleep. Before he fell asleep, he heard the shower running and it seemed to be Robert because he then heard the click of the office door after that. I believe Joe went upstairs joining Victor in bed to watch some Project Runway. Something important to note though is that before Joe went to bed, when he was still downstairs, he thought he saw something outside in the back patio area. So he went outside to check, but it ended up just being a spider. And when he came back in, he forgot to lock the door. So that's that everyone's in bed, right? After some time, Joe was woken up by the sound of the chimes on the door into the house. You know, like when you open a door and, and, it, and it rings. But he assumed that it was just Sarah coming back home after deciding not to stay in her friend's house after all. Then a few minutes later, Victor and Joe heard not quite screams, but these low breathy moans. And this was sometime before 11.45 PM. Uh Oh, okay, we have noise. Sorry guys. When they heard the moan and they went to go see what was up and the guest room door was open. So they went in. Oh, right, okay. So someone's right outside my window. And the guest room door was open. So they went in and they found Robert. Robert had been stabbed three times in the chest and abdomen. He was lying on the sofa bed in the office slash guest room wearing a gray t-shirt, a pair of gym shorts and his night guard because otherwise he would grind his teeth. And isn't a night guard something that you would literally put in right at the last second before going to sleep? 
could Robert have already been asleep when he was attacked and the knife was lying on top of him? Joe moved it to the bedside table and Dylan at this point was still groggy from the sleeping pill and apparently was very confused and Victor screamed when he saw that Robert was dead. This was confirmed by the next door neighbor who shared a wall with that home office and this neighbor heard the scream when he was watching the 11 p.m. news. At 11.49 then, the 911 call was made. I will just say, I was a little confused because the caller was a woman and I was like, what woman could this have been? But actually it was Victor who made the call. He just didn't correct the operator referring to him as a woman. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Maybe. Maybe, maybe. What's wrong, ma'am? We had someone that was in our house, evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now? I don't know. We heard. Are they bleeding? You see someone yes. bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where are they bleeding from? I think in the stomach. In the stomach? Be cautious. Uh, Calm down for me. I'm going to send some help, okay? Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was, spent, he was spending the night with us. Okay. And who was the person that stabbed him? Do you know? Is, he, know. is, is he conscious? We need an ambulance. Ma'am, listen no, to me. He's not conscious. He's not conscious at all? No. We need someone right now. Is he breathing? Listen, listen to me. Calm down. I'm going to help you, okay? Is he breathing? I'm upstairs, and he's downstairs. I don't know. Okay, who's downstairs with him? My partner is downstairs with him right now. 1509 Swan Street Northwest, am I correct? Yes, it is. The person that says, is he still in the home? I don't know. We have help in route. Thank you. They're, they're okay. here. They are there in route to you now. I'm saying the police and the paramedics, okay, to assist. Okay, what I need you to do is go downstairs, okay? The place where, wherever he was stabbed at, I need you to get a dry cloth, okay? And just apply pressure to that area. If he was wherever he was stabbed at on his body, I need you to take a towel downstairs while you're waiting for the paramedics to arrive and just apply pressure. Even if the rag or towel is saturated with blood, just get another towel and put it on top, but never lift the first towel off the area. Hold it on. Once it gets filled up with blood, just put another towel on top of that and just apply pressure until the paramedics arrive. In the heart? In the heart? Okay, is he breathing? Okay, we have help in row, ma'am, okay? We do have help in row. Okay, just go down there and try to tell your husband or your other um the other half to just try to keep him calm and talk to him, okay? Keep him calm and talk to him until someone gets there. Okay. And at the same time, get a dry cloth and just hold it right there in the area. My partner's holding it. Okay. It, okay. And once it gets saturated with blood, can I get another one? Go get another towel so you can apply it on top of that one once it gets filled up with blood. Okay. We, need, we need you to apply pressure on that area. You don't know who did this. We have no idea who did this. We heard the chime and, and we heard the scream from our friend. Okay. And so we came running downstairs. We ran in. So you both was upstairs and your friend was downstairs? Yes. We need them right now. I'm not hanging up, but we, we need help now. Okay, they are out, ma'am. They are in route. Here they are. Here they are. They're there. Help us. We have someone with stabbed They're on our second floor. <laughs> ma'am. And essentially he tells the operator that someone came into the house and stabbed Robert and he wasn't sure if the person was still in the house or not. One thing that some people found very weird is that Victor somehow knew that Robert was stabbed in the heart. Like how would you actually know if you hadn't done the appropriate medical tests? Like you, you just wouldn't know that. But this doesn't entirely strike me as any kind of red flag because he could have just said heart meaning the general area of the chest and the operator coaches them through applying a towel to stop the bleeding and a few minutes later the paramedics arrive what i do find to be a little bit of a red flag is that once they arrive victor literally loses it like he was pretty okay and able to explain the situation before they arrived but once the paramedics got there he just 
broke down in front of them. Now, maybe, yeah, it could have all just hit him how real this was when the paramedics arrived and that caused this emotional outburst. But I think it might be a little off. I'm not entirely sure. Something just feels a little off about it to me. The paramedics account of the crime scene went as follows. They were met by this hysterical Victor in his white bathrobe who told them where to go. They went up the stairs and found Dylan in the hallway who was also wearing a white bathrobe and he full on just didn't say anything. He just raised a hand and pointed down the hallway to the home office and then he went silently into his room and closed the door. Like someone's just been murdered in your house and you're just like, not even grunt, very strange. So when they got into the guest room, they saw Joe just sitting on the bed, not applying any pressure or cover to the wounds. And apparently he hadn't been doing this the entire time he was being directed to by the 911 operator. Also very strange. Like you could literally save this guy's life. Why would you not? Why would you not even try? When the paramedics asked what was going on, he just answered, I heard a scream. Okay. They then checked him for a weapon before he got up and walked away. So, other than Victor, there was this unusual sense of calm in the house, despite a murder having just taken place. The murder due to an intruder, no less. Dylan said nothing, Joe basically said nothing, and something they noted was that all three of them looked like they had just showered. Victor and Dylan both had their white robes on, and Joe was just wearing his boxers, and he looked like he had just showered. But there was something else they noted as very strange about the crime scene. There was basically no blood. No blood on Robert. No blood on the bed, no blood on his clothes. Like, Robert was stabbed three times in the torso. And afterwards it was found that one of those wounds actually was into his heart. Someone with injuries like that would bleed a lot. Not just a little, a lot. It would have been a very bloody crime scene. So, someone had clearly taken the time to clean up not just the crime scene, but Robert's actual body as well even taken the time to redress him because the clothes he was wearing were clean. Even though his t-shirt had three stab holes in it too. So it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. The forensics of this case don't make sense. They don't make sense with an intruder theory anyway. At the very least, the t-shirt would have blood on it. The only bits of blood in the room were the blood on the knife that was now on the bedside table and a few drops of blood on the bed and the towel in the room. About that knife at the scene, okay, the streaks were consistent with someone wiping it with a bloody towel and the pattern of blood on the towel was consistent with having wiped this knife. Strange. And no other bloody towels, rags or clothes were found anywhere in the house. Now this knife was found to be from a knife block in the kitchen, but actually they don't think that that was a murder weapon because the fibers on the knife were only consistent with the towel that was found in the room, but they weren't consistent with the fibers from Robert's t-shirt. And also the knife was too long for the wounds he had apparently. Okay, not to sound <laughs> dense, but does that not just sound like whatever way he was stabbed, the knife just didn't go fully in? Like, how does that mean that wasn't that knife? It doesn't add up to that for me, un unless it was like a totally different shape, then fine. But anyway, according to forensic experts, this was not the murder weapon. And that's interesting too, because a knife from a set in Dylan's room was missing. That knife would have been the right size to be this murder weapon and it's never been found. However, I'm gonna throw a spanner in the works here because I also read somewhere else that they then went back on themselves and found that the knife from the bedside table in the guest room actually was the correct knife and this was based on a testimony from a blood spatter expert. And was also based on the fact that the knife from the bedside table had not only Robert's blood but also some chest hair and fatty tissue on it as well. I don't know what to believe here. I really don't. Right, let's get into the investigation. Being the only three people at the residence at the time of the murder, Joe, Victor and Dylan were all brought in for questioning, of course. All three of them had the same story, 
that they were in their respective bedrooms and an intruder must have broken in and killed Robert. All three of them had the exact same details and their stories never shifted even slightly. And Joe put particular emphasis on the fact that he moved the knife off of Robert's body and onto the bedside table and he said that they would probably find his fingerprints on it and he also said that they probably wouldn't have the killer's fingerprints because he was probably wearing gloves. <laughs> if that isn't the sketchiest comment I have ever heard, all three of them made it very clear that they were gay and Robert was straight, which I don't know why that's relevant, but cool. And what I found really, mm, this is a red flag for me, they kind of minimized their friendship with Robert as if they were just old acquaintances when in actual fact, they had hosted Robert's 30th birthday party, they went to his wedding and they caught up multiple times a year. <laughs> Why minimize the friendship? Hmm. Anyway, obviously they had no proper alibis, especially Dylan, because he was literally just in his room on his own on the second floor. And the second floor, that's the same floor as the guest room. <laughs> so very close a little too close for comfort and obviously that couldn't be confirmed by the others an intruder coming in makes sense right only in order for this to happen first of all someone would have to climb over the seven foot security fence come through the back door which to be fair was unlocked go to the second floor past dylan's bedroom and by the way the acoustics of this house made walking down that corridor pretty loud so somehow no one would have heard them either take a knife from the kitchen or take a knife from Dylan's bedroom when he was in there. You know, that's depending on which is actually the murder weapon. And then the route the intruder took would have had to been walked through when in reality it was covered in cobwebs. Then the intruder would have had to stab Robert, wash his body, clean the room, either clean the bed linen or stab him outside of the bed and clean up whatever that area was and leave the house without anyone seeing or hearing. Oh, and also take any bloody towels and rags with them and all of that in about 45 minutes. So even if it was enough time to get through all of that, is it possible that they wouldn't have been seen or heard? How could you transport Robert's body into the bathroom to literally shower him redress him do all that stuff walk back not be seen or hurt like it, it, it hmm. Hmm, it's not adding up for me so maybe it's not all that plausible that an intruder came in but let me know your thoughts let me know your thoughts but then if there wasn't an intruder it would have had to be someone in the house maybe the murderer never left the house meaning it would have had to be Joe, Victor or Dylan. Dylan was the only one who was unaccompanied this whole time and his bedroom was the closest. I'm going to tell you a little more about Dylan in a bit. It's also important to know that after these initial interviews, Joe, Victor and Dylan all lawyered up with some of the best defense attorneys in DC and then refused to talk to police. That doesn't mean they did anything but it also doesn't look like they didn't. <laughs> the house as well when they investigated was searched thoroughly so thoroughly by the fbi forensics team they literally took entire sections of walls and staircases they searched computer hard drives they had cadaver dogs come in and stuff but before we get into what they found something was up with this there were 10 days between them receiving the search warrant and actually executing it which is just so much time and Anything that really needed to be cleaned up or any evidence that needed to be gotten rid of could have easily been gotten rid of and would have been long gone, which is infuriating. Okay, into what they found. The dogs alerted at the lint trap of a dryer, which was outside Dylan's room. They also alerted at a drain behind the house. Now, the drain cover was kind of off as well, like it had recently been taken off and kind of put back on, not very specifically and this led to the theory that someone washed the bloody bits and bobs in the drain outside and dried them in the dryer by dylan's room but they couldn't confirm if it was robert's blood they'd been led to or what the dogs also detected ecstasy in a cabinet in dylan's room and in a dresser in joe and victor's room again that doesn't necessarily mean that someone committed murder the other stuff points more towards that though Something they also discovered at the scene was Robert's Blackberry, 
which they later discovered had two emails drafted to Kathy that hadn't been sent basically telling her that he had showered and he was heading to bed and that he loved her. One was at 11.05 p.m. and the other was at 11.07 p.m. and there were only 42 minutes between this and when the 911 call was made. So was Robert interrupted by his attacker and that's why he never sent those emails? Who knows, that is kind of what would make sense, I think. Unfortunately, the Blackberry wasn't tested for fingerprints and other than those two emails, no more information was gathered from it before it was sent back to Robert's employer and literally put back into circulation, which is insane, insane. Some random person in his company would end up owning this Blackberry and have no idea that it belonged to Robert and was in the room when he was murdered. Now let's get into the autopsy. The toxicology report came back with nothing, no drugs in his system, nothing like that. But that said, they didn't test for paralytics and there is a reason that this could have been relevant but first of all robert also had multiple needle marks on his body one on the back of his left hand multiple on one side of his neck three in the center of his chest and two on his right foot second of all this could get a little bit graphic but there was semen on and in multiple parts of Robert's body. And I'm sure you know what I mean by that. Strangely enough though, it came back as Robert's own. So they were thinking maybe a toy was used to SA him, most likely when he was unconscious because first of all, Robert was straight, not to mention he was so happily married to Kathy and had never shown any interest in men. But second of all, there were no marks on his body to insinuate that he had been restrained. There were also blood vessels that had burst in his eyes, suggesting that he was also smothered, potentially with a pillow or something. And also, Robert had no defensive wounds. He was most likely either asleep or unconscious when he was stabbed because he didn't fight back at all. Also, this isn't related to the autopsy, but it's just something to think about. And that's, Robert was not killed on the bed clearly because there would have been blood everywhere would they have had time to rip off sheets and wash them and dry them and put them back on i don't think so i don't think so so where the hell was he when he was attacked and there was only one pillow indentation so once robert lay down there he didn't move at all so it looks more like he was killed elsewhere and then placed onto this perfectly made bed you know with the sheets over him and that was how he was found they actually did test for blood in the home office that couldn't be seen by the naked eye, presumably with the likes of luminol or something. And they did find trace amounts of blood on the walls, the floor, the sofa bed, and the door frame. Traces though. So it is a little confusing. All of this was showing up on the luminol test, but it was obviously cleaned thoroughly before the 911 call was even made. Now, I wanna talk about some of the holes in the timeline because there's a couple and we have to go there. <sighs> So first of all, the low moaning noises that the guys heard, if Robert had made those noises while being attacked, there would have been no time for the killer to clean up and get out before the others rushed in. And to this, I was thinking, well, maybe he made the low moaning noises after being attacked, but before he'd actually died. But then his injuries were said to have rendered him unconscious immediately. And it would have taken him between one and 10 minutes to bleed out. Would he have made these noises if unconscious? Can we do that? Maybe, maybe. As well as this, an officer called Diane Durham had spoken to Joe at the house on the night of the murder, okay? And he told her, that they heard the alarm, like the door chimes, and that's when they found Robert outside on the patio bleeding. And they took him upstairs to the guest room to lie him down and that's when they called 911, which doesn't make much sense either. And once the story changed from that to the other narrative, it never changed again. Seems like it was just too early at that point for his story to be fully straight. Also, I have to mention this, Joe, Victor and Dylan all claimed to have heard the chime on the door once when the intruder came in. Yeah, the intruder. But how come they never mentioned hearing it a second time when this intruder left? I just... Either the intruder left a different way because he realized how loud that chime was and he couldn't do that again. Or whoever killed Robert never left the house or they were in the house all along and the story about an intruder and the story about the chime on the door is complete bullshit. 
So you choose. <laughs> You choose which of those you find the most plausible. So the day after the murder, obviously Kathy was absolutely distraught. She was heartbroken. She had just lost her husband in this horrific way and had absolutely no answers. But she had Joe, Victor and Dylan come over that day and they spoke for about half an hour and she wanted to find out more about what had happened. So they had a chat about it. The next day though, she met with a detective and after this, Joe had tried to find out through his lawyer friends what Kathy had said to the detectives about her conversation with himself, Victor and Dylan. He really would have no need to know or even have any interest in what Kathy said to some detective unless he needed to know to cover his back. Or am I being too harsh here? Let me know. But then I have to play devil's advocate and be like, okay, if he was 100% innocent, maybe he wanted to ask simply to make sure that Kathy didn't think he was guilty or he and the other guys. Like we can't say that's not a possibility, but I suppose it really all comes down to the manner in which he said this. Like, did he go to his lawyer friends or whatever and be like, hey, listen, I need you to find out. Or was he like, do you think she actually thinks that we're guilty? Or, you know, those are two very different approaches. So would be very curious. Now, three months after Robert's death, the Swan Street residence was broken into. Two men took over $7,000 worth of electronic equipment, including a flat screen TV. And the two men that were charged with the burglary were Michael Price and Phelps Collins. Now, you might be like, okay, but like who the hell is that? Michael Price? Well, he was Joe's brother. <laughs> Another interesting tidbit is that the police had been preparing to make an arrest in the case around this point, but the burglary derailed their plans. I would just love to know if they had some kind of insider knowledge that an arrest was gonna be made, or maybe they were even being public about it. I haven't seen anything about this, but if these two guys knew and they did this as a specific attempt to throw the police off, maybe that would make sense if he's trying to help out his bro. You know, but then Michael actually did have a substance abuse problem and he had stolen from the Swan residence before. And this led some people to theorize that maybe on the night of Robert's murder, Michael broke in in an attempt to commit a burglary. But instead, when he went into the home office, which, you know, there would have been electronics in there, there would have been expensive stuff and there wouldn't normally be someone sleeping in there. But instead he found Robert in there and he panicked and killed him or at least just wanted to get rid of him as a witness. What do we think though? I'm not sure if it holds that much weight. And if the intention here had been burglary, whether or not it was Michael, nothing was taken. Even Robert's Blackberry was there at the crime scene and Robert had an expensive watch on. So burglary in general just doesn't make much sense. However, Michael was attending college and he did miss his classes on the night of Robert's murder. So what's the story with his alibi? I would love to know if there is footage of him anywhere, if anyone saw him that night, because maybe he would have had a key. He was Joe's brother. Now in October, 2008, investigators finally got an arrest warrant for Dylan. Two days later, he was arrested and charged with obstruction of justice. And the affidavit told us that the belief is that Robert was injected with some kind of paralytic. Then he was essayed, smothered, and stabbed. The following month, in November 2008, Joe and Victor were also arrested and charged with obstruction of justice. And on the 19th of December 2008, additional charges of conspiracy were filed against the three of them. And from here, they were set to have GPS ankle bracelets and a strict curfew was put in place for them. Now, according to the affidavit, there was overwhelming evidence far in excess of probable cause that Joe, Victor and Dylan had obstructed justice by altering and orchestrating the crime scene, planting evidence, delaying the reporting of a murder to police and then lying to police about the true circumstances of the murder. It also stated that Joe and Dylan had a dom sub sexual relationship with Dylan in the dominant role. A lot of people who knew Joe presumed that he was totally innocent and that this was all just a big misunderstanding until they read this affidavit and they found out the cold hard facts. There was just no denying his involvement anymore. There was just too much. Joe and the others had their lawyers completely dismiss those theories and they played 
the homosexuality card. They said that people were speculating and making inflammatory comments about their lifestyle. Maybe that would happen in, back in those days, but are you just kind of using that as a cop out? Right. I am not here to judge people's preferences in the bedroom, all right? But it's time we talk about Dylan's interests because when it comes to the case of a murder, let alone an unsolved murder, it could well shed a totally different light on the case. Found in Dylan's room was the following, okay? An electric shock device, metal and leather collars, penis rings and vices, shackles, mouth gags, clamps, BDSM books about pain and pleasure with multiple passages highlighted. And Joe's computer showed evidence that himself and Dylan were very familiar with this electro shock machine and they had looked at certain websites, certain films, if you will, showing electro torture. So what are your thoughts now? Does that sway you in any way? From where I'm standing, it looks like things happen like this. Dylan wanted some action with Robert, but knew that he wasn't gay and he would probably be turned down. So he incapacitated him in some way. He then SA'd him and maybe Robert started to wake up in the middle of it all or something, which could have been the case if there was stuff like electro torture going on. Although I don't think there's any evidence of that specifically in this case, but that would be when Dylan felt the need to kill him. Now, whether the intention from the beginning was to kill him or not, I really don't know and honestly I'm not convinced although I could very well be wrong there who knows I think then Joe had the next level of involvement by helping big time with willingly cleaning Robert and the crime scene and I think Victor had the least amount of involvement considering how emotional he was that night but I do believe he still has information I do believe he knows exactly what happened and maybe he also helped with some crime scene cleanup. As for the finer details, like the specifics, I really don't know, but just let me know if you agree or if you think it all happened in a totally different way. That's just how it makes the most sense to me. Now, in 2008, Kathy filed a $20 million wrongful death lawsuit against all three of them. Two f***ing right. She was accusing them of destroying evidence, conspiring to cover up how Robert died, and wasting time cleaning up and getting their story straight instead of calling 911. They literally let him lie there and die while they figured all this out. Honestly, good for her. That is the absolute least she deserves. And this was settled out of court in August 2011 for an undisclosed amount. In June of 2010, Joe, Victor and Dylan all went to trial for those charges of obstruction of justice, conspiracy and also tampering with evidence and they wanted their case decided by a judge, not a jury, and none of them testified. They were so strongly connected to the law world, they probably knew what would give them the best chances of getting off the lightest, so that's what they did. And by the end of the trial, and you will absolutely not believe this, but the judge found them not guilty. She believed they knew who killed Robert, but prosecutors failed to prove beyond reasonable doubt that they were definitely guilty of these crimes. <sighs> also very important to be aware that during the trial, a paramedic testified that she had attempted to inject an IV into Robert's body in several spots, but she was unsuccessful. And this for some reason was not documented properly. So that could explain the needle marks all over his body. However, with that said, some of the marks didn't align with medical intervention. So maybe that doesn't explain that away. The most frustrating thing is that in this case, nobody has ever been charged, which is absolutely shocking. It's one of those scenarios where someone literally needs to confess. Our three suspects now are living in Miami, which I'm sure is lovely, after Joe sold the house and the three of them decided to move down there as a family. <sighs> so they're having a great time and that is all we've got on the case of Robert Wan. Essentially he was stabbed to death in that house and it seems pretty obvious who knows all about it and I just hope that the guilt eats them from the inside out because Robert was too young, he and Kathy's love was too fresh. Their love story ended way too soon and his life ended way too abruptly. Also, Robert was quite literally one of the most selfless people. Why would someone do something like this to someone like him? Just make it make sense. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button below 
and subscribe to the channel. I was having a look at the analytics recently and the majority of you who watch my videos actually aren't even subscribed. Obviously you made it this far in this video. If you don't wanna miss out on future videos, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you haven't seen this video on the screen right now, you definitely want to see it. This is a case that absolutely blew my mind. I cannot believe a criminal was this blatantly obvious. It's like this guy was trying to get caught. Other than that, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.